eyes are all really dark now, so I won't be able to see you. Um, but hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Danielle. I'm really excited to be here. Um, Amsterdam is such a wonderful city, and um, thank you all for coming to see me talk. I know that we have, we're have we running a little overtime, so um, I'll try to get us out of here as soon as possible because I also didn't eat breakfast, so I'm really hungry. Uh, okay, so let's get started. I'm going to talk about forms, um, and here's the slides link. It's pretty, uh, so if you want to follow along, I do uh, have medium amount of code. Uh, so if anyone wants to follow along on their computers, uh, if not, I'll have this slide link at the end as well. So first of all, I'm Danielle. Uh, you can find me on the internet here, on Twitter and GitHub. Uh, I'm a New York City-based software engineer. Uh, this is me usually, um, happy, smiling, uh, love to be around people and love coding. This is me this week, so I do apologize ahead of time. Um, this is the <laughs> tone of my voice and I also, um, I might not look like I'm having fun, but I'm actually incredibly excited to be here. Uh, so I work at Heroku. Uh, for those of you that don't know, it's a platform for managing and running your applications. I work on the lifecycle team, so we're responsible for a set of features that are uh, for an application before it hits production. Uh, I'm also a student at NYU, because with the little amount of spare time, I decided I didn't want any free time, and so I'm getting my master's in cybersecurity. So I've been working with Ember for about four years. I created this, uh, what I call the expert ladder. And so when I was a beginner, I started out and I didn't have any experience with any JavaScript frameworks. I had dabbled a little bit with Angular, decided I didn't uh, care for it. And um, so I started working with Ember. I became someone who was a resource at my company, so people would ask me questions. And now I've gotten to the step in my career where I actually formed a lot of opinions about different things in Ember, um, where the framework is going, and uh, really great patterns to do things. So that's what brings me here. Um, <clears throat> so that's why I'm here to talk to you about how to build forms. I have dealt with a lot of um, Ember applications that have to deal with a lot of data in my career. So um, I built forms over and over and over again. And so the accuracy of the forms is really important. Um, I've realized how important just user intuitiveness is. Um, I've built a lot of forms for non-technical people, so that um, it has led me to have a lot of opinions. And so, oops. So forms are everywhere. Uh, we have them obviously on Heroku and they're on social media and um, on just like basic functionalities like building a calendar. So, show of hands, I can't really see you, but does anyone actually like building forms? <laughs> you like building them, good. That's actually more than I thought. So, for a long time, I felt like it was a little bit of a game of whack-a-mole. Um, a lot of times when you have forms, it might be one component for one form. You're like, oh, I can, I can, this can work in my favor too, and so you might add some functionality, and then a test breaks, and then you fix the test, and then something else that isn't tested breaks. And so I always got really frustrated while I was building them. And so I tweeted this, now it's been about a year and a half, um, and I just put this out. I didn't expect anyone to respond, it was just out of a moment of frustration. Uh, now it's actually kind of embarrassing because Somebody on Ember Core saw that and they messaged me and they were like, hey, do you want to chat? So, yeah, I was busted. Um, and so I talked to them and I'm actually glad that I had a, was able to have a conversation with them because I was able to say, okay, these are all my pain points and this is coming from someone who has used Ember for a couple years and was repeatedly doing working on the same types of features over and over again. So. It's kind of a knock on me because I hadn't developed any patterns, but it was also because I didn't really have a lot of resources to do so. And so that brings me to my three parts um, of the talk. Some of them we're gonna spend longer than others, but uh, this is what we're gonna go over. So first we're gonna talk about how we can make our elements and components composable. And so this is the example we're gonna use. Everyone's been in a situation where they are, they've had to build a form, um, and like the scenario that I said before, you have a form that's already built in a code base. You have your, uh, you have a couple <laughs> functionality that you could use for other, uh, for the thing that you have to build. And so as you can see here, there's like radio buttons, there's a lot of um, attribute bindings. 
I don't know if I added any actions, but, and so I have an idea, let's add a bunch of other functionality to this one component so I can use it for one other thing, because that always works. And so you might have this where you're using the component and then it grows to this. And then this clearly, I mean, just blatantly, uh, just up front, this is incredibly hard to test all the different scenarios, so that's already terrible. I don't know what that, I don't know what that is. Um, or, uh, yeah, this is hard to test, and plus this is just really obnoxious because if you can imagine the component, uh, the actual class that's, that's or the object that's handling this, there's probably a lot of logic, a little more than we need. And so, we thought that this was a good idea, and then soon, maybe like a couple hours in, if you're really committed to this idea, maybe a couple days in, you realize that this is a terrible idea. And so how do we turn this, which is 62 lines of code, um, and turn it into eight lines? And that's what I'm gonna show you how, walk you through how we can do that. Oops. And so that brings me to my point, which is composability. And so just to give a face to the name, uh, composability is a system design principle that provides components that can be selected and assembled in various combinations to satisfy user requirements. And the important part here is that it can be assembled in various combinations. And so that's what components should also be doing, is that no matter their size or their structure, they should be able to be assembled in various combinations. A component, for the most part, um, it should be able to be used, reused over and over again. And so when you start thinking about these design questions when you do start building composable components, what can we think about? Well, in forms. Uh, other things, there's a lot more. What type of field is this? Uh, is it handling a certain type of data, a number, um, a certain question? Um, is this a required field? This is pretty binary, but it, there, it, it's important and we'll go over why later. Uh, is it dependent on another component? Sometimes there's just logic that we have to get from another component, so we need to handle that state. And then, um, does the, the component handle, or does it supply functionality, or uh, does it supply actual UI for the user? So, I removed the divs just for simplicity's sake, but let's take this example here, and we have uh, groupings, label input, label input, and then uh, we can actually turn this into this. And this is not groundbreaking. I'm sure we all know that we could do this, but I'm gonna explain why this is better to do, um, just so I can drill it into your minds and uh, make you appreciate it. So, so this is an example of what that component would actually look like in the template. And it is only a couple lines, and it seems really simple, but this is actually doing a lot for the user and for yourself as a person writing that code, uh, and other people that might use that code base later. So, yeah, okay, so let's talk about the benefits of using this really, really small component. Uh, so first, you're standardizing the API of that form element. Uh, you've already set a standard for the code base that you're working in where you're saying, okay, we are definitely gonna use a label and we're using input, and so if we have email, an email input, whatever, it's just gonna be the exact same element across the board, and we're only gonna use this email input because it validates, it does pattern matching, it does the proper error messaging, et cetera. Um, and then it also standardizes the UI, which I kind of touched upon the first point. Uh, we have this element that looks the same, and we just use that exact same email element across the application might seem obvious now, but for non-technical users who get confused between different UI elements, that's really important. So let's take that second group of uh, that form that we were working on, and so we have a question and two radio buttons and then another input. And so, oh yeah, and then this is using Ember radio input or radio button. And so that's really good because it groups the buttons together so that it could be assigned to one attribute in uh, whatever model that you're, it's bound to or whatever it's representing. And so we can make this, this using a contextual component. I used uh, the angle brackets, hopefully I'm using it right. Um, and so we are, so now this is the, so this is just in case you forgot what we were looking at. And so this is the component that is yielding, that, that contextual component that we were using, and so we have, uh, 
This is the handlebars template for it. And so it's using a hash helper. And so what that hash helper is, is it creates a key value structure so that, but we don't ha just have to return text or something um, that isn't as complex as, uh, say, if we were using a helper for text. And so we have this text helper and it takes a string and then it yields text. Uh, and then we can also yield a component. And so we use the component helper and then we use a string input to yield that component. And so what's really powerful about this is that we can add classes um, as we need to and style them. We can add other elements that we need to. So if we're using it in one place, we can use it in another place and actually add different elements and components within that component. And then another powerful thing is that we can also overwrite options, or not options, uh, <laughs> attributes in those components. So it's really customizable and it's reusable. And you can just do a whole lot of stuff. So this is a diagram that it kind of shows the different pieces of the, that component that we have just built. And so we have two components that are responsible for rendering more components. And then we have a couple components that are responsible for rendering that output. And so as we saw before, we have like first name, last name in those two components, the two first ones. And then we have our yes, no component, and then which is the radio buttons, and then another input or text input. And so, oh, I changed the color accidentally, whatever. Um, so, so we have two different distinctions between components. We have one that is rendering components, or we have one that's yielding components, and then we have another one that's rendering UI for the, for the view. And so just to bring it full circle, this is kind of uh, concerning that that last question that we had is, okay, are, we are these components supplying functionality or are they supplying UI for the view? And so as we talked about the benefits before of our really in standardization, but also that these form groupings aren't re are reusable and they're not bound to their initial layouts or attributes. And then also this is way easier to test because smaller pieces of code are tests than uh, large templates. And so we have turned this, which was 68, 62, something, a lot of lines of code, and we can actually turn it into this, which, like I said, is eight lines of code. And so the next part is, uh, next I'm gonna talk about having performant data. And so, oops. Um, so I wanted to do like a raise hand things, but since I can't really see anyone, I guess, so I'll just have like, you just shout it out if you want. Oh, there we go. <laughs> wow, uh, okay, so first, um, so it's just, I guess left for true, wait, this is my left, yeah, left for true, right for false. So the first uh, statement should be all data should be loaded into, I can't read, all data should be loaded once the application completes a transition into a route. True, false. Okay. So, what do you mean? Yeah, sure. Okay, so this is false. Um, data that isn't required uh, by the view should not be hold up the page from rendering. So, uh, so we're taking the same example of a form that we had before and we're swapping the radio buttons for a dropdown and this dropdown has, makes an API call to, for state, um, just a set of resources called state, whatever you would like that to be. Um, and so, so when we're looking, we're designing this, there's a couple questions that we want to ask and is to think, okay, what can we do to, so what, what should we do, um, what should we be thinking about if we are adding data to this component or the loading of data? data responsibility. So um, is this data essential for when the user lands on the page? And so here we can say no because the user, um, the data that is being loaded by the route should be the data that is only essential for that page to be loading. And so as we could see there, that was a not a required field. That set of data doesn't have anything to do with that user that's being that it's interacting with, and so that's a no. Um, is it important in the scope of the route? Uh, this is also no, we kind of answered that before. Um, and then is it a concern of the component? 
Well, this is yes because we have a drop down that is representing these data, this data set. And so that way, so this means that we can fetch the data for the component. And so this is what this might look like. We've all used these uh, really great lifecycle hooks in the component. And so we can use will render, and then we can encapsulate the state of the options um, just by setting them directly there. And then we also can use error handling. And uh, so this is a really good uh, pattern where you could just have an error handling class for the entire application. Uh, to me, this is just like the, uh, the stereotypical way to use a service object because error state can, uh, if it's like universal error state from the different APIs and the requests, and that could be represented. Um, and so anyway, so you can just inject your service and just send your error. And so how do we handle retries? Well, we can do that also from the component. And so we can uh, also use the will, the will render hook as well, and we can use a task um, using Amber concurrency, which is, uh, if you haven't checked it out, which it's really awesome uh, to handle concurrency. And, and then we can have a threshold of five failures. And so we can just keep retrying and say, okay, well, just in case we do need this, these options, or they are more important than just a non-required field, we can keep retrying. And then if it does actually fail, so let's say it's a third party API and you know, we don't know if it's gonna fail or succeed or if it's always, um, it's always not working or whatever. But, and then we could say, okay, this actually, you can have a, a failure message. And so the benefits of this is that the user is able to interact with the application sooner, and also that relative data is handled within the scope of the component. In other words, um, if you have a component rendered in 10 different routes, you don't have to fetch the data in every route. You only have to fetch it in the, the, um, in the scope of the component. Oh, I forgot a point, and it's easy to test. It's so tiny. Uh, okay, so data should be always be validated at the model or server level. Yeah, we could just do like hand up if you if you think this is true. Okay, good. Oh, one person said, yeah. okay, that's fine. I'll show you why that's wrong. Uh, <laughs> so data can be validated anywhere. Uh, so we have, we can validate data pretty much anywhere in an application. We have, uh, we can validate at the component level, at the, model level in Ember data, or we can, if we need to validate something like uniqueness, or I don't know, that's the only thing that comes to mind, but uh, then that can be make a server call, but we can configure that in our, at the component level. And so when we're thinking about this, we should think, okay, for taking an input, is the validation specific to the input type? Okay, am I, is it a phone number or an email which require very specific uh, regex matches? then that's pretty easy. I can just validate it right where the, at the user, and then, um, so yeah, and then I could go to the next question and think, okay, well, can I reuse this error messaging that is, that's linked to this validation? Uh, just based on what we were saying before, if it's something like pattern matching, then yes, we can reuse the error messaging. Then you can validate it at the component level. And this is, uh, again, not anything that's too groundbreaking, but um, there's this really great, oh wait, so we can encapsulate the validation within the component, um, and so that way the model level and even like the server level doesn't have to validate some of these arbitrary things like, um, you know, is, is this an email, does it look like an email? We can do that when the text is actually put into the text box. And so Ember CP validations is really great for this, it's just a, an, a class that you can create and you could customize your validations and then add them to any Ember component, or not Ember component, any Ember class that you see fit. And so this is my last true false. Ember models should always reflect the back end that persists them. True, false, true, false. Okay, so this is also false. Um, the data store that can be used to represent client side state. So use that to the application's advantage. Uh, this I find is kind of um, blurry with some people that are just getting into Ember because they have the impression that Ember is used to interact with APIs. I, um, I don't know if, it that, if that is actually what it's supposed to be used for, but I think that Ember data should be a reflection of the application state. So what that means is that, so the difference between that is that 
Um, let's say we have an Ember model and we can just call it a signup form. And then we have a couple inputs that are bound to that signup form. And so this is what this might look like, is that we just have a signup form that's a model and then we have a couple inputs that we've bound those attributes to. And so the reason that we would do this is that um, this simplifies some of all of this, instead of just using like a user model, it simplifies all of this logic into a single model and it represents the state of the application. And so the user was to navigate away from the, from the page and then come back and we still want their user, if it's a landing page, we still want their stuff, their user information in the text box, then the, all of that stuff is still there because we have that single model that's represented that form. And so what it's doing behind the, the application, so from Ember data backwards, um, that can actually be uh, tweaked so that you can actually make an API call and then that updates your, your backend so that you can create or update a server. And so what this pattern is known as a, is as a facade. And so what that is is just kind of simplifying what you have on your front end so that you can do some more complex. I know the sign-up forms are that complex, but they can be in this example. Um, and so it, it simplifies that complexity in, from your back end. And so what this might look like is you have this form that's bound to a sign-up form. And so that makes an API call. And then we simply, once that API call resolves, simply unload our sign-up model and then we update or create a new model for a human or user. So again, just a snippet of code. Um, after we save and it saves successfully, it unloads the record. So let's see. Okay, so can anyone here, is there anything that you see about this form that might be weird or hard to understand? It's fine, it's not, you're not supposed to know. Um, okay, so this is an example of a form and this is the same form that someone that um, has some form of colorblindness might see along, as opposed to someone that does not have colorblindness. And so, so this is another weird thing that happens with forms sometimes. Um, if you're using a form, you tab, and then it goes to another uh, um, input, and it's kind of confusing and jarring, but since we can see the form, that's totally fine. But someone, that, and this happens a lot with modals and, um, and, and things where you're kind of taking, uh, hijacking the DOM and doing weird things. And so, um, so this is fine because we can see this, but someone that's using a screen reader, this might be confusing because you think, okay, well, I'm an email, should first name be full name or, so make sure that when you're, or I'll, okay, I'll go into that. And then this is obviously really annoying because someone with a slow internet connection will see this, which is just loading forever. I won't try not to keep this up here too long. Um, and then someone else with a better internet connection would just see a form that pops up. And so this all, this bring me, brings me to my last point, which is accessibility. And there's, it comes in many forms and, um, so it's important to think about every accessibility in all of its forms. Um, and so I'll just go through a few pointers very quickly. Uh, oops. And so uh, I mentioned before that indicating required fields is really important. Uh, it's just one attribute. Uh, you can use, it's just a, a string that you add to the input or you can uh, if you're using the, the input helper from Handlebars, you all, that also has a required attribute. It's super easy. The browser takes care of the rest. Uh, it just has it, every browser has its own required API where it does some sort of, um, it just tells the user, hey, this is a required field in, with like different messaging. And it's supported on all browsers, in case you were wondering. Uh, okay, so the next thing is to label everything. Um, you can use ARIA tags. I would just say label everything. There's no reason to use ARIA tags. Um, and so what this does is it associates a label with uh, an input box. This is good for screen readers as well. And then also, um, if you're using things like radio buttons or checkboxes, uh, if you actually have, if, you, if a user clicks on the, the um, the label, it will, instead of the radio button, then it will select it anyway, so it's just good user experience. So yeah, so make sure your for attribute is matching the ID attribute and the input. Okay, next, enable logical tabbing. 
I already showed how annoying this is. This is annoying even if I uh, wasn't able to see the screen. I feel like this happened to me before and it's just obnoxious. Uh, and then use clear success and error messaging. Uh, this one seems obvious, but it's actually not, I, it's actually, um, I feel like this isn't addressed as much because if you have an error message in, it's just, oh, that's fine. This is, we, you know, we gave them an error. But if you're not clear with your error message, then the user doesn't know what to do and then they're probably gonna leave or use another service. And so here's a good example of what Facebook did for once. Um, they have, I tried to put in an email address that uh, was not in their databases and so they gave me this error message that said, we don't actually have a, an, anything in our databases that match that email or phone number, so why don't you sign up for account, which is not what I'm gonna do. And look, they got it right. It's a great error message. And so closing thoughts here. Uh, so just to kind of round it out, I think that when you're building features, forms specifically, but just anything in general, try to think about who the consumer of that feature is and also who's gonna be working on it after that in six years, not six years, six months, one year, or six years, actually. And if you don't care about the user or other people, then at least think about yourself because um, if you don't want to work on this code in a year or if you can't build on this code in a year, um, then, yeah, that's really, that, yeah. It, if, if you don't want to work on that code in a year, then you should probably think, rethink about how you're writing it. Uh, and that's all I have. Thank you for listening.